Shana Tova. Welcome to 5,781. I am Martine Handelman Duffy, a student at NYU studying playwriting and coming to you from New York City. I will be your Rosh Hashanah guide and host. Thank you, Bacha Levine and friends, for warming us up and welcoming us into our New Year celebration. This is the Reboot Higher Holidays Beyond the Book Arts and Culture stream. This is the space for the creativity, artistry, and inspiration we all need to ensure that the high holiday season provides transformation. Here, you will find artists, actors, musicians, writers, filmmakers, culture creators, cracking open our ancient texts and rituals, engaging with the themes of the holiday through conversation and art. This Beyond the Book stream was produced by Reboot, an arts and culture nonprofit that reimagines and reinforces Jewish thought and traditions to evolve the Jewish conversation and transform society. At any time, you can enter the in the book thread for more moment by moment liturgical offerings. But this is the place to jump into the margins for inspired conversation, music, and theater. From the host of Brain Games, Jason Silva, Zach Rogue of Rogue Wave and writer Starly Kine, to the Resistance Revival Chorus and TikTok celebrity chef Jake Cohen, 
we have so many special guests in store. Keep in mind, we will throw relevant links into the chat as we go along. And if there are any ideas our artists spark, go ahead and put them into the chat as well. Next up, to mark the birthday of our very precious world, we've got climate change activist and the author of newly published Youth to Power, Your Voice and How to Use It, and a fellow student at NYU. Take it away, Jamie. Hello, my name is Jamie Margolin and I'm an 18 year old climate justice organizer, co-founder of an international youth climate justice organization called Zero Hour, author of a new book called Youth to Power and film student at NYU. And I'm also on a lawsuit suing the Washington state government over continuing to delay and action on the climate crisis while the world burns. I recently moved to New York for film school and I mean, it's been pretty good. It's definitely difficult to move to a place where I go, I go to a school where I didn't know anyone here at NYU and I've still been struggling to make friends and I've been feeling a little lonely, but it's been a dream of mine since I was little to live in New York City and so now I'm here. And obviously it's under COVID circumstances, so it's not the same as I imagined, but I'm still really grateful to be here. We are already too late in preventing any climate change. Like the climate has already changed past tense, so there's no, preventing climate change from happening when climate change is happening. But can we prevent it from getting worse? Yes. Can we save life on earth as a whole? Yes. So if we don't take action, it's going to be very, very ugly and it's only going to get worse from here. And honestly, like I don't really see society as we know it continuing. However, if we really take action, really do immense radical climate action, then I think that we can preserve a lot of humanity and we can preserve a lot of our world and it's still the climate the damage that has already been done has been locked in which is why i said it's too late to prevent any climate change but it is early enough to prevent it getting from a lot worse from here we can still take action and i don't want anyone to be like oh it's too late so let's just throw our hands up and party till the end of the world like no we are still at a point where we can really take action and it's not like too late rosh hashanah is known as the birthday of the world in jewish culture and all I don't think of it as the literal birthday of the world because that is much, much longer. And I think it's more of just a, a remembrance of like where we came from and reflecting on the past year and doing everything we can for the new year. I think what the world is wishing for this particular birthday is uh, in short to breathe. There's a lot of things that are preventing us from breathing. The COVID-19 crisis, the coronavirus pandemic is inhibiting people's ability to breathe because it's a respiratory disease. The wildfires and smoke are inhibiting people's ability to breathe. Um, then there is the whole issue of police brutality and the police are inhibiting black and brown folks, especially black folks from breathing um, with their violence and with their, their inherently corrupt system and their racism. I think there's so many things that are stopping different people from breathing, um, that I think that what this earth, what the world wishes for, I guess, for this birth, for its uh, Jewish 5,781st Jewish birthday um, is to breathe. The worst that could happen if no one does anything about climate change is, you see how the entire West Coast is on fire? Imagine that like times 10. Like, we are in the beginning stages of climate breakdown and it's already absolute hell. The sky is literally the wrong color. And so I speak of the climate crisis like an apocalyptic emergency because it is an apocalyptic emergency. And if the entire West Coast being shrouded in flames and smoke isn't waking you up to that, then honestly, I don't know what will. I don't believe in just sitting there and being optimistic for the sake of being optimistic because nothing's gonna solve itself. So the only thing that really gives me optimism is seeing people in action, is seeing mass action, is seeing many, many people mobilizing for a cause. So that's really what gives me hope because that is the only hope that exists. I don't believe in doing the work for justice alone. I feel like you need to do it in community and you can contribute your own talents and skills to that, but no single person is going to be the hero that, that magically solves the climate crisis or any of these other issues. It's really going to be um, something that we work together on. There's really no secret message. I know people often expect something a lot more like elaborate like ah oh, that's the key but it's really not it's really just like call up the number on the organization's website hit them up via email dm them try to get involved to find someone in your community who's doing work and ask them how they got involved it's really just find your community that best suits you this toolkit is enough for you to like okay 
get get involved, get in the fight. And that was my goal with this book. So if you really want to get involved, read the book. And it also has interviews with young people from other organizations and movements who also tell you about their experiences because I'm just one person. So yeah, that is my cheap but good answer, I guess, because it's like, it has the information. This is a long form answer to your question of how to get involved. So go read that. To older folks looking at the West Coast on fire and thinking, oh God, like I didn't do enough or I left this problem to my kids and I feel so guilty. I'd say like take that guilt and turn it into action. There is no pride in sitting in your guilt and being like, I'm so sorry. No one needs your apology. They need to do your action. Guilt and, and, and feeling bad about it is not going to unburn the west coast um it's not going to bring back the lives of everyone who has died because of the climate crisis all that you can do is move forward and take action and devote your life to this cause in whatever way that you can but i'm not anyone's savior i'm just a kid who's taking action this is my college dorm behind me i have a lot of homework to do after this so i'm just like trying to take it one day at a time that's really all i've done and that's all you can do too so don't think that there's anything special about me because there's not shana tova happy rosh hashanah um, though saying happy seems a bit weird because there is so much tragedy in our world. I really just say, um, okay, this feels really, really weird for me to be referencing Frozen 2 in this, but you know what? It was a good movie, so I'm going to reference it. Um, there's a song in that movie that just says, uh, the next right thing, and it's all about when the world just seems dark and closing in. Just take a deep breath and just do the next right thing, the next right thing, the next right thing. And so that's all I encourage you to do is to do the next right thing. And I cannot believe I ended this speech quoting a Disney princess movie, but you know what? I have no shame. That's what I did. So do the next right thing and just do the best that you can. It is the long, 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 surreal early summer of 2020. Because of the pandemic, you have been inside with your family for a few months now, and it is heating up outside. Not just because summer is beginning to really settle in, but because the nation is on fire. George Floyd, a black man, has been lynched by four police officers, and the video of his murder is played again and again. People are in the streets, and they are angry, demanding restitution and, beyond that, justice and reparation. You have been one of these people in the streets. You have also been a witness to the intimidation, repression, and assault of protesters exercising their First Amendment rights. Your city is noisy. Day after day, you hear the wail of ambulances, the barking of agitated dogs, the whir of helicopters. You crave silence, repose, respite from the heat. One day, a friend emails with a link to an Airbnb on a quiet property less than two hours' drive from your city. From the images, it appears verdant and peaceful. There are hammocks and a small, inviting pool. You have never stayed in an Airbnb, but this one features super hosts with high scores for hospitality and cleanliness. You book your stay. Driving up several weeks later, you are aware that the property is even more lovely than it looked on your computer screen. The sign outside says, Certified Organic Farm. There is the main house at the end of a tree-lined gravel drive. Your host's directions are impeccable. Turning left, you follow a grassy lane to your cottage. There are two other cottages, both of them quaint, as the website promised. The key is in the door where it is supposed to be. The cottage is clean, as advertised. No one comes to greet you. The pandemic makes that risky, but it is wonderful to smell the air without a mask. You breathe. But something is unsettling, and you realize it right away. It is in the architecture. It is in the smoothness of the worn wooden floorboards. It is in the very silence that you craved. Later, as you are walking around the acres of fields, you run into your hosts and ask. Yes, they say, this 18th century farm was the site of slavery. Enslaved Africans and their descendants lived and worked here. The ones tasked with agricultural labor lived in rough-hewn structures, out of sight from the main house. 
Others lived in cottages, one of which you now inhabit. On one of the websites for the property, these modest structures are called dependencies. In the Oxford English Dictionary, which you consult later, definition 4D of dependency is an appurtenance to a dwelling house. As an example, the dictionary cites an 1822 novel by Washington Irving, in which a character visits the stables, dog kennel, and other dependencies of a grand estate. The association of dependency with animals does not escape your notice. Your Airbnb is haunted. It is haunted in the sense of which Toni Morrison wrote in her novel, Beloved. Enslaved people occupied the space you now occupy, are trying to relax in. You attempt to imagine what the cottage, long since refurbished and rebuilt, once was, who it housed. You realize that despite everything you might have known about this lovely place, you somehow were unprepared for this revelation. You feel dumbfounded by your own powers of denial and by the irony of having wanted to get away from the city and its noisy reminders of social strife and struggle. Now that you know about where you are, where you have arrived, you cannot unknow. You grasp for a means of honoring the ghosts. In your culture, lifestyle gurus talk about mood boosts and the value of self-care rituals that promise to dispel negative energy. Websites provide how-tos for sage burning ceremonies based on Native American tradition. You want something other than such empty commercialized gestures. Using the Wi-Fi connection from your cottage, which was once slave quarters, you email your rabbis. You explain that you need a prayer, a ritual. You tell them you've considered the mourner's kaddish, a prayer you can recite by heart. But the praise song to your Jewish God seems inadequate to the task. Besides, the thing you seek to reckon with has not died. It has just changed form. It is a hum at the edge of hearing. And it is not just the cottage that vibrates, but the trees and the fields, the nation. Your rabbis write back. Perhaps you could look to the Passover tradition of ritually expelling chametz, or leavening, from the home. In preparation for the holidays, Jews remove, sell, and even burn chametz. But for the undetected crumbs that we inevitably overlook, we say the bitul, a prayer of nullification. There are rules for saying the bitul. The bitul must be said in a language you understand. For you, that means saying it in English, not Hebrew. The bitul is the responsibility of everyone in your household. The bitul requires tending. Because it may not have worked the first time, you need to repeat it. A few days later, when you leave the cottage, you do your makeshift ritual. You take a small stone from the ground and toss it over a fence that marks the boundaries of the estate. And you say a prayer of nullification for the chametz that remains. You imagine the chametz as dust, microscopic particles that permeate the air, but which you can only see under certain conditions of light. You know you can't expel them, but you ask for their nullification. The house of the American nation was built on arrogance, on chametz, that takes several names. One of the names is slavery. Another is white supremacy. One of the names is law and order. Another is angry black woman. Even words like diversity can be forms of hamets. The hamets of anti-blackness is impervious to good intentions. There is hamets in your liberal city and your tolerant home. By definition, hamets persists in the very places you think you have already purified. To nullify it requires intention, concentration, constancy, and vigilance. It has been months since your discomforting confrontation with the history that shapes the present, but you have not forgotten the lesson of that time and place or the blessing that you said. This structure was built as a house of slavery. Just as slavery has an afterlife, so the memories contained in the walls of this house and in the very ground on which it stands are a stain to this day. 
we want and need to rebuild the house. Let all who enter the walls of this house learn from our past and our present and sound the shofar of freedom. May the bell of freedom always ring and may it echo through our very lives.